Hello, I'm Adam Rosen and welcome back. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about pain control and total knee replacement. This is actually a shortened version of a lecture I gave a few years back. As we all know, the number of total joint replacements in the United States is increasing exponentially. And it was an op-ed piece in the New York Times around 2005 that really brought to the attention of the public how painful total knee replacements can be. It was right around that time that we were introduced to pain being the fifth vital sign. And it was an editorial in JBJS by Dr. Parvizi that noted that we do not control pain well in approximately half of patients undergoing joint replacements, and that there were a number of newer ideas to be considered in helping us manage postoperative pain better. So what are the reasons as to why we should be so concerned with patients' postoperative pain? We know that if patients have uncontrolled pain following surgery, this may inhibit their ability to do physical therapy and can delay their discharge from the hospital and prolong their recovery. The old thought processes in surgery is that you would do surgery, patients would wake up and have pain, and at that point you would initiate treatment. That thought process has been changed completely and now we're quite aware of using preemptive medicine to start the pain management process prior to surgery using a multimodal philosophy, limiting the use of narcotics, if not eliminating them, and using different types of anesthetics and blocks, all in attempt to decrease the postoperative pain and improve function and rehabilitation after surgery. It is important, however, to remember that when we're treating postoperative pain, that the treatment can begin both in the preoperative arena, intraop or periop, as well as postop. And a lot of times these treatments will overlap to give a better overall control of the pain in the patient after surgery. There are lots of things that we can do preoperatively to help minimize or reduce the postoperative pain that patients will have. This is done in part by reducing anxiety and educating patients, the idea of prehabilitation or exercise, and the use of medications. This was a study that looked at how easy it was just to reduce anxiety, and improve satisfaction by educating patients. I do four things with my patients prior to knee replacement surgery. I obviously have a long discussion with them in the office and use a knee model for that discussion. I have a written handout that I've put together personally that goes through the entire process for them to take home and read. We do also offer an online video that patients will go at home and watch and have the option of watching multiple times. And then we also use an app-based program for our total joint replacements that includes a lot of the same information but given out piecemeal throughout the entire process leading up to, during, and after the knee replacement surgery. There are a number of non-pharmacological measures also available for patients to help reduce both pain and anxiety as well as opioid use. I'll commonly refer patients to a number of apps that are available that they can download to their phone and these are things that some patients find to be very helpful around the time of their surgery. The idea of prehab has come and gone over the years, but at this point I believe that there is enough data to support its use. I strongly recommend to my patients that they get involved in an exercise program, and we initiate this with handouts that I give to them in the office. I also help them set a schedule in anticipation of the fact that they're going to have to do therapy throughout the day at home after knee replacement surgery, so it's good to create those habits prior to surgery. We also use our app-based program so they can start a different number of phases of exercises at home prior to surgery, and all of those, I believe, help my patients in their postoperative course and rehabilitation. But the idea of preemptive analgesia is not new. You can learn a lot by history. And if you can see here, this was an article published in The Lancet over 100 years ago talking about the idea of using regional blocks to block pain prior to surgery. Now, there are a number of options available for preemptive analgesia. In addition to nerve blocks, you have a number of medications. The important thing to remember, though, is that the medication should not be given just prior to surgery, but its effect should peak at the time of surgery to get the maximum benefit. I define good preemptive analgesia as treatment of a patient prior to the surgical procedure using appropriate medications given at the appropriate time to combat pain and inflammation due to the surgical intervention.
But it is important to understand that pain does not come from one thing. There are different things that can cause pain. And if you address just one of those things, you're going to be missing out on other pain generators. So the idea of using a modimodal philosophy is to address each of those individual components that overall contribute to the person's postoperative pain. Because we know now that narcotics alone are not a great way to control pain, and patients that are on chronic narcotics prior to knee replacement all tend to have lower pain scores, more problems, stiffness, and revisions. And for that reason, I do my best to make sure that all of my patients prior to elective knee replacement surgery get off narcotics, especially if they've been placed on them by someone else for knee arthritis. In patients that are on chronic narcotics for other reasons, my goal is to get them off the narcotics prior to their knee replacement. But in reality, patients that are on high doses for chronic neck or back pain, if you work in conjunction with the patient and the pain management doctor, you can at least get them to cut their dose in half or by more prior to surgery. But I make a strong effort to educate those patients as to what those risks may be by being on chronic narcotics. So there are a number of things available to control pain perioperatively under both the control of the surgeon and or the anesthesiologist. Like a lot of other institutions, we were interested in the use of Depidora when it became available, but we ran into a lot of the same postoperative difficulties with respiratory depression that other institutions reported. And although epidural and spinals are very helpful and useful, we've transitioned over a period of time to the use of general with associated regional blocks. There are a number of blocks available, including femoral, and sciatic, single shot versus indwelling catheters. And although there is a strong benefit from these, they do come with certain risks. As this study demonstrated, with nerve blocks comes risk. Increased pressure, fluid, and swelling can cause compartment syndromes. Without pain, people may have weakness and fall. There's the issue of bleeding associated with additional use of medicines which can increase patients' risk to bleeding. And like any procedure, the appropriate timeouts and site marking must be performed to prevent the wrong leg from being blocked. My experience with blocks and anesthesia for my knee replacements has been that over time with spinals and epidurals, we ran into issues with patients that were on Lovenox years ago as a common preventative measure for venothromboembolism. And also if those were either underdosed or overdosed and patients had side effects or poorly managed pain that led to increased patient dissatisfaction. When we went to using blocks, we tried femoral and quickly adopted sciatics as a way to better control pain. But what we found is these patients had prolonged perineal nerve palsies and that the block was so good they rarely took medicine. This was prior to scheduled the use of medications, and a lot of these patients had a significant amount of rebound pain following the operation. When we transitioned to just using femoral blocks with other medications, the issue that still arose was there was quad weakness, which led to the use of knee immobilizers for almost all total knee replacement patients. So commonly now we're using adductors which give excellent pain relief without the associated quad weakness that we saw with the femoral blocks. That in combination with a preoperative cocktail and scheduled non-narcotic medicine postoperatively has led to a significant improvement in our patient's pain as well as function, shortened length of stay, discharge, and overall satisfaction and better outcomes. A lot of surgeons have also found the use of an intraarticular injection or periarticular injection as an aid to help decrease pain. We did a small study looking at the use of ropivacaine for an intraarticular injection at the time of arthrotomy closure. And although there was this, not a statistical significant difference in this small cohort, what I found with a lot of those patients is that the initial pain was reduced slightly, but the wounds appeared to be better. And I do believe that an injection of any sort may increase the pressure and cause a tamponade effect, reducing the chance of an intraarticular hematoma. A number of surgeons over the years have studied and reported on their personal combinations of different cocktails to be used for periarticular injections. I've tried a lot of these combinations myself and haven't found a significant difference in my patients with my above-mentioned pain protocol. 
but I believe that one of the most difficult timeline portions to control pain in is the postoperative course. And the difficulty over the years has been that there is a huge number and amount of options available for medications to treat this postoperative pain. And although it used to be extremely common for patients after total knee replacement to receive high doses of opioid narcotics and PCAs, luckily that is no longer the case. For many reasons, narcotics are bad, but we saw lots of patients that suffered from a lot of the side effects, including postoperative nausea and vomiting, ileus, respiratory depression, confusions which could lead to falls and other injuries as a secondary side effect from these medications that we gave in an attempt to control patients' pain. We are all familiar with how effective Tordal can be to reduce postoperative pain and inflammation. This study showed a decrease in the hematocrit postoperatively, but it wasn't clinically relevant. And when used in postoperative total knees, this can reduce the need for additional narcotics, which could also increase the risk of postoperative nausea and vomiting. A number of studies have looked at the use of Celebrex for postoperative pain control and have showed the use of decreased narcotics. I've been very happy with this drug in my practice as I found a lot of the patients have done well, and I haven't seen any increased risk of wound complications or bleeding. Although dexamethasone was studied early on in non-orthopedic surgical patients, a number of studies recently have shown its effectiveness in treating postoperative pain after total joint replacement surgery. I did a small study about 15 years ago, looking at the use of dexamethasone, and although we did not show a statistical difference, we did show an increase ambulation distance on the day of discharge, but most importantly, the concern was whether or not it would have any effect on infection, and it did not, and other studies have shown this as well. It was not too long ago where a common postoperative course was bed rest for 24 hours and a three to five day hospital stay. Nowadays, it's extremely common to have a patient up within a couple hours and occasionally go home the same day or a short 23-hour observation stay in the hospital. All of this early rehabilitation, up, out of bed, and mobility has led to decreased pain and better patient satisfaction. Although, as the surgeon, you are the captain of the ship, it's really important to incorporate all parties involved in patient's care. Years ago, we created a pain committee which involved the physicians, the nurses, and the pharmacists. And the attempt there was to make sure that we were all on the same page in putting together a safe combination of medications to help decrease patients' pain and decrease the risk of polypharmacy. We've come a long way in controlling patients' pain postoperatively. It is quite common now to have no opioids or an opioid-sparing postoperative pain management protocol. And the idea of stacking different medications in the smallest dose possible in an attempt to hit all of the different receptors, which may lead to patients' postoperative pain, has led to better patient satisfaction, better outcomes, and shorter lengths of hospital stay. Studies have looked at the effects of all of these multimodal pain protocols. They have shown decreased manipulations in patients undergoing total knee replacement surgery, They've also shown that patients have been out of bed faster and sooner when their pain is better controlled. And once again, this has been also shown to improve overall patient satisfaction. But pain management is sort of like fly fishing. You have a box full of flies, but what worked on one day on one stream for one fish may not work on every fish. So it's really up to you to go through and figure out which combinations work best for you but to also have backups and alternatives in particular patients where the standard protocol is less effective than you would like it to be. So my current philosophy now includes the preoperative aspect, which also includes the education and the information and the prehabilitation. In addition to the medications that they get the day of surgery, I also have the patients start on two Tylenol twice a day for two days prior to surgery. When they come in, they get Celebrex, Tylenol, Oxycontin in my younger patients, Neurontin, Zofram in almost all patients, but if they have a history of severe nausea and vomiting, they do get amend. Intraoperatively, we use a single shot adductor canal block with IV Decadron and an intraarticular injection. Postoperatively, the patients are started in the hospital on 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol every eight hours, 
and Celebrex 200 milligrams twice a day with Neurontin 100 milligrams three times a day. They'll continue the Tylenol for two weeks at that dose and then cut it in half. The Celebrex is once a day once they return home for two weeks and then as needed. The Neurontin, we give out a prescription, have people cut back if they don't need it or if they're having pain, add it. I give out a prescription for oxycodone, only 20 tabs. These are to be broken in half at home by the patient and only to be used for severe breakthrough pain. And I find that most patients, if they adhere to the protocol with the Tylenol and the Celebrex and the Neurontin and the exercise plan, that many people don't even go through the full 20 tablets. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this talk on pain and total knee replacements. Until next time, thanks for listening. I'm Adam Rosen.